Uh, first of all, I want to say two things. Uh, first of all, I'm really crappy uh, presenter when it comes to making presentations. So I'm trying to cheat using Prezi. Uh, so if you get like motion sickness, it's all on me. Uh, next thing is that this is a quite difficult or, or uh, unexpected setting for me because I think that I'm, I'm not really an expert in business on, or marketing stuff. And uh, every time I'm supposed to be in a, at a venue, which mainly consists of peer people or business people or marketing people, it's quite, uh, kind of difficult for me. But then this summer I read an article about uh, the Swedish social web camp. Have you heard about that? Like this uh, web hike for people that like internet. Uh, which is a... I, I've, be, I've been there once. Uh, it was a strange uh, situation. Um, but this year, in this article, there was a great quote by the founder, Thomas Wenström. Uh, he was asked what, what he hoped that was going to be discussed on this year's uh, camp. And I was expecting an answer like... Um, latest in e-business or the click-through rate in our business model or something stuff like that but he answered that he was hoping that uh, that there were supposed to be more discussions on the fra law the nsa surveillance the snowden leaks and that really ch changed my mind because that made me understand or i mean this wasn't really news but it was really glad news to hear that people that are interested in uh, e-marketing, uh, social innovation, or entrepreneurship also have the capacity to discuss stuff that I think is important. So that's why I'm here. Uh, my presentation is called, In the World of Technology, We Need to Hack It All. But it's really about that knowledge about technology also includes a responsibility to share that knowledge in order to understand the world. Uh, I'm an internet researcher at the Lund University Internet Institute. Uh, it's a small institute connected to Lund University, which is located in, in Landskrona, at the citadel in Landskrona. This is a great setting for research, of course, but it's also fascinating to be in a historical context. This is a, a medieval castle with the cannons and, and like it's a fortress, and we're researching the future together. That's quite interesting. If, you, if you're anyone, anywhere close, I'm suggesting a visit at, at the Citadel. Among the stuff that we do is to research like file sharing stuff, illegal things online. Why, why are people considering internet a uh, zone without laws, for instance? And that is also both when it comes to users and when it comes to governments. Why is internet a zone that's considered to be you, you can do whatever you want there. So we have, we have researched the Pirate Bay, for instance. We're also quite common when it comes to being an expert in stuff. Getting back to, to Lina's presentation. Uh, this is from like the, the news show, Breaking News, of Wood, Philip and Frederick, when I'm supposed to know something about the Iranian internets, with, which I, I happen to know, and I, I will come to back to that. More about me. Um, I'm uh, not only an internet researcher, I'm also an internet activist, which means that I'm trying to do good things online and also good things for the internet. This g gets back to uh, my young days. In uh, 94, I started using IRC, chat protocol, uh, and I started to hack Nazi chat channels. That was my hobby. Because, uh, well, being a, an immigrant, I'm, I was targeted as a non-Swede quite early, and I thought that in my arena, I need to do something. And internet was my arena even back then, so I started to hack stuff. I also started to climb trees. This is a really, uh, yeah, Instagram moment, kind of, yeah. <laughs> um, this is important, not only because we tried to save the forest, uh, a small forest in Uppsala where I lived. We failed miserably. Uh, they chopped down the forest and built some ugly houses. But the interesting thing was that we, we used the internet to mobilize the protests. And this is like 97, 98 maybe, quite early. But we used internet news, newsletters and email chains to try to gather people to, to climb the trees with us. Um, failed, but was fun and interesting. 
Later, I was uh, in uh, Piratbyrån, founded the uh, anti-copyright uh, organization Piratbyrån, promoting piracy, promoting all stuff that was important for me back then, uh, namely to keep information free online. This is from an interview in uh, Swedish TV, uh, where the subtitles are not correct, but fun. <laughs> and later on, that knowledge was uh, focused to to speak at venues in, in different sites to explain how can the internet community be used or the understanding of the internet community be used to also understand the politics of the internet and also how this is changing our future. Today, this is my, my short schedule. I'm going to take you back, back then, over there, then back here, because we're here now, and also discuss what to do with the stuff that we know together and then it's a question in uh, Q&A. So back then, this is not Sweden, this is not internet, this is Prague, 1968. Uh, the government of uh, Czechoslovakia was being overthrown by so, uh, the army of uh, the Russians, the Russian army from Moscow. Why? Well, because they demanded some kind of democracy within the, like, the communist uh, sector of, of Europe. This is interesting. Not just because it's an interesting uh, fact that this, uh, this happened quite close to us, but also because my father back then was, uh, had moved to Sweden and was working from a cellar in Gothenburg producing uh, dissident material that was uh, smuggled into Czechoslovakia trying to change the system. Using the technologies that were, uh, that were present back then, like printing presses, like old cars, uh, they smuggled books and literature, pamphlets, articles over the border to Czechoslovakia where the, where the information wasn't allowed to exist, trying to influence people in order to uh, get more democracy. Some 30 years later, 40 maybe, this is the Iranian elections in 2009 kind of the same thing happened. People of, of Iran wanted something else that, that, uh, that than the, th the things that they had. They wanted democracy. They pro get on the streets, protested, and got squashed by the regime in Iran. Printing presses weren't really that, um, th that important back then, uh, now, but the internet was. So the Ira Iranian regime started to close down internet sites, started to censor the internet, starting to make it hard for people to get, hard, uh, get in touch with information about the actual situation. Now me and my friends, not in Iran, but in a cellar in, not Gothenburg, but still in Sweden, uh, started to discuss how could we do this, get the situation in Iran to get a little bit better but by using the knowledge that we had. So me and uh, a lot of my friends and other uh, groups along the, the internet started to setting up proxy sites, setting up mirrors of sites that were censored in Iran, all the things that we could do from our home in order to get some more uh, possibilities for democracy to, to, uh, to grow in Iran. Of course, I mean, the struggle was in Iran, not on, on the internet. But still, by using quite easy access technology here, we could do uh, some, we could, we could make a change for people in Iran. And this is especially interesting as a case, because the regime in Iran told like, uh, international media that their actions against the free information were uh, fair, because they used the same, same kind of legislation that we used in Europe. When they started to censor stuff in Iran, they claimed that we do it in Europe as well, which we do. But here we have a legislation, in, oh, here in Sweden we have a system for banning uh, child pornography sites. In France we have a, a system for banning um, fake medicines, for instance. In Spain there's a ban against uh, uh, illegal gaming sites. And in Iran there's a ban upon um, oppositional or dissident media. Same systems, different content. They started to surveil and, and track people in Iran. They claimed that we did the same things in Sweden or in Europe, which we do. We have data retention in Sweden and Europe. 
which means that someone is watching us, someone is uh, interested in what we are doing and when, and with who. But on different grounds, of course. I mean, here it's terrorism. But in Iran, this is terrorism. And I think that there are many connections that are meant and imp really important to be made between uh, our communities. This is Sweden, of course. We have data retention. This is just a short, uh, quick start to, to internet regulation. Data retention. It's supposed to surveil or make it possible to survey people in order to understand who is doing what, with when and who. Uh, so there's a system gathering information about which calls we make, to who we, we're making them and where we are, where, when we're making them. Supposed to be in counter-terrorist legislation, but hap happened to be uh, devolved since Swedish leg legislation changed the uh, setting of the data retention in order to, to make it easier to keep data. So now it's, it's only you need to be a suspect, a suspect for a crime that can give up to six months in jail to be a, a suspect for data retention which is most of the crimes here in Sweden, which makes all of us potential criminals if we drive too fast or what, what it could be. The more known FRA law, which is supposed to surveil the traffic that comes in and out of Sweden, that passes uh, over Swedish borders. Okay, fair enough. But the problem is that the internet doesn't see any borders. So traffic that comes th through Sweden could be even Swedish traffic, because we use international sites or, or services. Also, this was hardly regulated in the FRA law, so this was meant to be uh, a law or a possibility for only the, uh, the defense intelligence to, in order to uh, spot threats against Sweden. But hap it happened to be a fact that quite soon after the law, the Swedish police was interested in, in uh, getting the data from this law to get the data of the information that the FRA was gathering. And IPRED, for instance, which is a file sharing law, uh, which is uh, meant to kill piracy, kind of, by uh, making it easier for, for companies and rights holders to, to get information about who is file sharing. It's, a, it's a supposed to connect an IP address, I mean, the, the personal number of a computer, to a physical person which it doesn't, because the IP address uh, could name the, the connection, for instance, but not the person actually using the computer. So in Sweden, we have a couple of laws that makes it easier for police, for intelligence, for even for companies to track our, use, our usage of the internet. And the same laws are used in other countries uh, in order to put repression on democracy activists. So what? Yeah, okay, okay. We have a decent, uh, I mean, we have uh, regulations and legislations in Sweden, but we could claim that Sweden is a democracy, so we shouldn't be afraid. But then something happened this spring. You know this guy, right? I mean, this is a Snowden room, so I mean, I, I think that we all know Snowden. Suddenly, a couple of leaks came from the NSA, from the American intelligence, claiming that almost all the international web services that we use as common users give stuff, give information to the American intelligence. It was all from email, chat, videos, everything was gathered and somehow transferred to databases that, were, that belonged to the NSA. It did go, get worse though. Suddenly, NSA claimed to track the internet, like the, the overall internet, not just from the services, but also the internet as a whole, even more than Google, which we think knows all about the internet. Then the UK intelligence suddenly happened to, uh, according to leaks, to tap into the internet fibers, I mean, the, the, uh, like the main broadband connections of the world and they tap it direct into them to, to collect information about stuff that they think is important. But we don't know what it is. And then further on, 
it came as a new, like a news flash that NSA and, and the UK intelligence actually cooperate. Maybe with FRA as well. We don't know that. And this is a bit strange because, I mean, we should know that this, this, this shouldn't be a surprise for us. We should know that this, these things happen. But it gets worse. Here's a news clip from like the day before. Uh, there are apparently trash bins in London collecting Wi-Fi information about people passing by them. I didn't know about this. Really strange. But we as a tech community, in a, in a broad sense, people that understand tech should understand that this is a bad thing. So when we see this, we shouldn't just like think that, oh, this is a, a bit bad. We should also express our feelings and explain for people that don't know about this, that don't know the consequences of trash bins collecting our personal data and explain it to people that this is not really good. As a technical community, we should understand that stuff like this Therefore, the spy, uh, sp uh, the, therefore the, the boss spies on employees. This is quite common in Sweden, that bo uh, bosses or companies want to know what their employees do online during work hours. We should understand that this is only like a, another way of uh, putting the same kind of surveillance that we see on, on bigger issues and also in Iran, in, for instance, and other uh, less democratic countries. This is an ad from a newspaper just a, a year ago. As a tech community, we should stand up and, and say that this is not really a good thing. It's not really a good thing to, to promote a service that expressively want to track your wife. They had other ads claiming to track their kids, for instance. But the, but the logic is the same. And I think it's quite important that we start to think about not only what we, what we can do with our technologies, we can build magical business sites, of course. We can build very intuitive uh, services for getting the cheapest sushi or uh, making it possible to use your fre frequent flyer points in the airlines for something fun. But we should also knew, know that the knowledge that we have is something that we could use to understand regulations, legislation, democracy, politics, and we can actually use that in order to change the world a bit. So I have some kind of conclusion of, uh, of my talk here, and I, I really want people that have like the slightest understanding of technology and I include the people in this room for that, of course, to use that knowledge to explain to people that maybe don't have or don't have the possibility to learn about technology what's actually happening. Because we live in a society that is more and more based on technology, it, the good parts and the bad parts, of course. But we need to translate that into human speak to get people to understand how that relates to them. For instance, it's not a good idea to have a system or to promote a system that tracks your wife because that could be an issue in domestic cases, except of the bad wording of the tracking your wife. It's not a good idea to uh, encourage a company to spy on its employees because that also encourages people to do stuff uh, to hide what they are doing and also to maybe feel bad about getting to work which is a good, bad thing. It's not a good idea to install parent fil filters on your child's computers, because if you do that, you will have no possibility to know what they're actually doing, because they will go into hiding. So you have no possibility to talk about bad things as well. And, of course, we need to talk about the fact that we have regulations and re legislations that are quite intrusive, and that can sound, sound sane in Sweden because we claim it's counter-terrorism or something. But in other parts of the world, it's not counter-terrorism, it's counter-democracy. And that's a problem. Thanks. <laughs>